Is anybody else thankful for God's grace this morning? Jesus. God, today, today we say for the hundredth time, we are so thankful for who you are, for your grace, for your willingness, God, to take us back when we do wrong, for your willingness, God, to choose us even when we chose against you. Today, we give you a fresh yes. We're hungry. We're thirsty for you. We pray that you'd open up our eyes and open up our ears to what the Spirit is saying this morning. God, we give you our full attention. We give you um, our love. We give you everything today, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. And you guys may be seated. While you're being seated, would you give it up for our worship band today? Highly skilled, highly talented. Overflow worship. Going on the road soon. I'm kidding. I just throw that out there. I don't, I don't know if they're going on the road soon. I hope, I hope they are. Uh, real quick before we jump in, obviously, I want to say hello and thank you for joining us. Any of our online guests this morning that may be watching via live stream, that may be watching um, maybe on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever you choose to watch this. And um, would we all, one more time, give it up for any of our first-time guests in the room. It's a privilege to have you here today. I've got some special guests in the building today as well. I always have a special guest in the building. If you haven't noticed, I'm always, um, I always have different people here. And you know what? The thing is, and I don't, I'm not going to toot my own horn, you should have a special guest in the building with you when you come. Like, that's kind of our job as a church is to bring people. And uh, I've been trying to bring people myself, and i got two special guests today, uh, Mary Helen and my Aunt Ann. Would you guys just raise your hand real quick? Would you give it up for them? Love y'all. It's my cousin, my, my aunt. Um, today, we're going to jump right into our verse. It's going to be in Luke chapter number 15. It's the same story that we read last week. In your Bible, it may read the lost son, the, the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but I want to refresh our minds on that. Luke 15, chapter number 11. And uh, we're just going to jump straight into it today. This is Jesus talking. He says, it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father, and I'll say this. I'll say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned to his father. And it's important today. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father, he interrupted. He said to his servants, quick, Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you know that we are right now in the middle of a brand new series entitled True Love. And if you saw the video that was posted uh, via Facebook or Instagram, whatever is your favorite social media choice, you saw that within this series, we're tackling kind of three topics. We're tackling God's love for us, we're tackling our love for God, and then our love for other people. And last week, if you were here, you know, obviously by the sermon, we talked about God's love for us. And we planted our um, tent pegs, so to speak, in verse number 20. And if you would, just bring that up for me, verse 20, Luke 11, 20, I mean, Luke 15, 20. Um, this is what it says. It says, while he, talking about the son, was still a long way off, because that is where we all stand without a, uh, an encounter with the love of the Father. It doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter what we've done in our lives. If we don't encounter his love, we stand a long way way off. It says, while he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, 
he ran to his son. Because the father, he's not just waiting for us. He is running toward us. He is actively pursuing us. Jesus, it says he stands at the door, knocking, asking to come in. It says he is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 others to diligently search for us while we are still out doing our own thing. He is the lady looking for the coin. God, he pursues us. And it says after he ran to his son, he hugged him and he kissed him. Maybe it says embraced. He embraced him and he kissed him. And he didn't, he didn't yell at him. He didn't scream at him. He didn't tell him how irritated he was with his decisions and to go get cleaned up from being with those pigs. Nope. He hugged him and he kissed him because the father is all about restoration over retribution. He wants to punish his enemies. He doesn't want to punish his children. That's not what the father's about. In this line here in 20, you notice there's a sentence that we haven't really talked about yet. And it's the very first sentence in verse number 20. And it says this. It says, so he returned home to his father. Now, I don't want you to get twisted in this. The father's love for his son never ran out. In the midst of all of this happening, his love um, was there, but the father was never going to force his son to stay at home. He wasn't going to force him to live by his rules and to live by his guidelines and to live how he wanted him to live. He wasn't going to force him to do that. He didn't go when the son left and drive his Chevy to wherever the son was and get his baseball bat and crack the son over the top of the head, knock him out, tie him up, put a gag on him, throw him in the back of the pickup truck, and bring him back home. That's not what happened. And the reason he didn't do that is because the father, he was in this thing for true love. And true love, it can't be forced. True love is a choice, right? There's a couple different sets of people at this house, but the main two, we got sons and we have slaves. Slaves, they're forced to stay. Slaves don't have a choice because you don't really love your slaves. Slaves, they're just the hired hand. They're just there. You're not in it for true love for them. And so they're forced to stay. But sons, when it comes to sons, it comes to true love. And because of that, sons get a choice as to whether or not they stay or whether or not they leave. And if you're married, you know this. True love is a choice. But also, you know, true love cannot be forced. While it would be easier for me to make all of our decisions and then force Sam to love me after I made him, it would be nice sometimes to be able to do that. I can't. Sam has to choose to love me. While the dating process would have been so much easier if I could have just walked up to Sam and just said, you're going to love me, and just forced her to do it, it would have been nice, right? But that's not how it happens. Uh, She had to choose to love me. Another thing that you figure out when you get married, especially when you get married, you've been with someone for a long time, is that true love isn't about feelings. Dating is about feelings. Now, dating's all about feelings. You get giggly, and it's fresh, and it's vibrant, and the other person can do no wrong, and you have the butterflies. But see, when it comes to marriage, marriage has to do with this thing called a covenant. Marriage has to do with you making a choice in the matter. You choosing to stick with that person through thick and thin. You choosing them in sickness and in health. You choosing to stay with that girl even when she blows the budget on a new pair of shoes. Been there. I'm just kidding. I haven't been there. I'm throwing her under the bus. You choosing to stay with that guy when he eats the food you were going to eat for lunch the next day. Because he stayed up late watching ESPN, right? Because true love is a choice. That's why I would even say you can't really experience true love until you get married. Because in being married, that's when you start having to make the real choices. And the father, he left the choice up to his son as to whether or not he was going to stay, as to whether or not he was going to leave. And even as to whether or not he was going to return home. And so this first sentence in verse number 20, throw it back up there one more time. We're going to keep looking at it. It says, so he returned home to his father. This first sentence is super important because it deals with the son's decision to return home to his father. Now, contextually, if we take the two passages that are before this story, that moment is the son's moment of repentance. Now, repentance, it's a big word that we use in church a lot of times, and sometimes people know what it means, sometimes it doesn't, so I don't want to insult your intelligence in telling you what repentance is, but in case there's someone in here 
Who doesn't know what repentance is when I say it? Repentance is the moment when we're broken over our sin and we realize that it is keeping us from all that God has for us. And so what we do is we decide in a moment to turn from our sin and turn to God and choose him. Many of us can remember a moment of repentance in our lives. Um, and real quick, I just want to make sure that you guys know this. A lot of times, um, and it just kind of popped in my head, I wanted to, wanted to go over this. A lot of times when we talk about the first sermon that Jesus ever preached, we go straight to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, everyone, I've, I heard it this week. Someone said, yeah, it was Jesus' first sermon. And that's, the problem is, is that's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But if you look at Matthew 4, 17, see, it says something different. It says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' first sermon to all of humanity was not the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' very first message to all of humanity was the need for repentance. And you got to know this. Repentance is not just a one-time thing. Repentance is an everyday thing. For a lot of us, we, we've had that moment of repentance. For me, I still remember that first time I ever did it. I was 16 years old. I was at a youth conference. I was broken over the sin that I had been caught up in for a long time. I, I had been um, trapped in insecurities dealing with what people thought about me. I was all but addicted to pornography, and I was living a double life behind my parents' back, and I was done with it. I remember feeling the love of the Father draw me, and I remember coming down to the altar, getting on my knees, giving everything to God, repenting for my sin, choosing him over my sin and receiving a forgiveness and a cleansing like nothing I had ever experienced. And for a lot of you, it looks like that. And for some of you, that moment looked different. If you're like my wife, her moment of repentance, of change, of, of when it happened for her, it was just in a small group. She was just in her small group. And a lady started talking about how God wanted to use her and had a purpose for her life. And she was like, all right, well, I want to serve God. And she prayed and she decided right then and there that she was going to choose God. She was going to turn from her sin and choose instead to live for him. And while all of us, or many of us in this room, have had that moment, and that moment, it is legendary, okay? It's epic, it is so important, but what you gotta know about that moment is that it's a starting point in your life. A lot of times we have a tendency to limit repentance to our moment of salvation. We repent, we give everything over to God, and right then and there, our journey with God starts, and our journey with God stops. But as believers, we are called to live a lifestyle of repentance. you got to know in this story, it, this story is not about an unbeliever encountering the love of Christ for the first time. All right, In the Bible, this story is about a father and a child. And in the Bible, unbelievers, people who are lost, they aren't considered children of God. Jesus in John 8, he says, if you don't believe in me as the son of God, you're a son of your father, the devil. And then in Romans, it says, if you don't believe in Jesus, if you haven't accepted him as your savior, you are an enemy of God. And in this story, we're not dealing with an enemy. We're not dealing with a son of the devil. In this story, we're dealing with an individual who has a child parent relationship with God and has made some mistakes. And I don't know about y'all, but I've been in a child, repair, child parent relationship with God for a long time, and I have made some mistakes. I've messed up. I have chosen to do the wrong thing time and time again. And so when we read this story, we got to know this story, it's not about a lost and dying world encountering Jesus. This story is about you and I. This story is about God's family, the people that are now known as the church, and their need to continually live lives of repentance. Through the cross, God displayed true love by choosing us. Through repentance, we display our true love by choosing him back. Turn with me real quick to 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John 1 Verse number five, this is what it says. It says, the message 
This is the message we heard from Jesus, and now we declare to you, God is light, there's no darkness in him at all, so we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We aren't practicing the truth. And while sometimes we take that verse and we're like, well, if you're in sin, then you've never encountered the love of God before. You're not saved and you're going straight to hell. But that's not the truth. Let's keep reading the verse. It says, but if we're living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now here, this is the important one right here. Number eight, you gotta remember John, he's writing to believers. He says, if we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. So John, he's writing to believers and he's saying, yep, you're a Christian and you still sin. And even though you are already in the family of God, he still wants you to experience that fresh cleansing and that fresh forgiveness over and over again. And the only way that we get to do that is if we are willing to, as he puts it, walk in the light. If we're willing to confess our sins, if we are willing to walk in repentance. Now, when I say repentance, repentance, this is what it is not. Repentance is not just saying sorry to God, right? It's not an apology to God for the things that we've done wrong. Now, I'm not telling you not to apologize to God. In fact, I think we should apologize to God. We apologize to our friends and our children and our spouses when we do something wrong. And I think that the reason we like that when people apologize is because God does like that. But repentance, it doesn't just deal with an apology. The idea of repentance is much bigger than that. If you would throw up that Greek word metanoia, that's that's the Greek word for repentance, and this is what it means. It doesn't mean to apologize. It means to think differently or to have a change of mind. Repentance is when we begin to see our sin the same way that God sees our sin. It's, when, it's not just saying sorry for our sin. It's being disgusted by our sin. It is hating our sin the same way that God hates our sin, right? Repentance is not like, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I said the F word. I'm probably going to say it again, though, so you're just going to have to get ready to forgive me because things in life, they happen, and you know they happen, and you know I'm not perfect, so sorry. I receive your forgiveness. That's not repentance, okay? Now, God, he still loves you if it happens, but that ain't repentance. Repentance is when you do something that you know you weren't supposed to do. I'm talking about the thing. We all have the thing, okay? That one thing that gets us. For some people, it's gossip. Some people, it's pornography. For other people, it may be I don't, drunkenness. I don't know. You name it. Getting, getting angry, not washing your words. It's when you do that thing, and you approach God afterwards, and you're like, God, I am so sorry. I never want to do that again. And I pray that you would empower me to walk free from this sin because I choose you. I don't want to live in this sin anymore. I'm not, I'm not even trying to make excuses, God. I want you way more than I want my sin. The book of Romans suggests that if this isn't the kind of lifestyle that we are living day to day, that it's not that God doesn't love us. It's just that flat out we don't love God. Romans chapter number six, it says, should, should we continue in sin? This version, should we keep on sinning so that God can just show us grace whenever we sin? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how could we ever want to continue living in it? As believers, our lives are not marked by our struggles and our mistakes. As believers, our lives are marked by consistent growth, by consistent victory over the sin that used to hold us back from the Father. As believers, our lives should be marked by the consistent decision to choose God over our sin. Acts chapter number three, verse 19. I want to I wanna hit on this verse for a second because it's sometimes confusing when we read verses like this. It says, repent and turn to God. We got that one down, right? Repentance, it's turning from our sin to God. And then it says this, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing can come from the Lord. Now, we read verses like this, and we get confused, and it's the same reason I didn't mention that first sentence in verse number 20. 
Because we get confused over the order of the events sometimes, right? This verse, it says, repent so that your sins may be wiped out. And then that first sentence in verse 20 in, in Luke with the son's decision, it says he decides to come home, but only after he decides to come home does he then encounter the love and the forgiveness of the father. And repentance, it's an action verb, meaning that we do something. It's something we have to do. And a lot of times if we read verses like this, we can come to the conclusion that by something we do, we can earn God's forgiveness. But that's not the case. You gotta remember, the father's forgiveness in that story, it was available the entire time, right? It, it, it didn't say that once the son got home, then the father was like, you know, he was like, fine, I'll forgive you. No, the father's forgiveness was available throughout the entire story. The son's repentance, his action to return, it put him in position to accept that forgiveness, but it never caused him to earn that forgiveness. One thing you got to know about repentance is that repentance does not earn us our spot in the family. Jesus earns us our spot in the family. Even look at the son's speech. Uh, we don't have it up there. Look at the son's speech on the way home. He's traveling home, and he's got this speech written out. He's got, he's got his phone out. He's got it on its notes. He knows exactly what he's going to say word for word. He's, he's going to say, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven, and I'm no longer worthy enough to be your son. He, he knows. And he gets there, and he recites it word for word. He knew exactly what he was going to say. And when the father runs to him, the son, he pushes him back, and he's like, no, no. He's so, he's dramatic about it. No, I don't deserve this. Father, you can think he's choking up a little bit, getting his tears going. Father, I've sinned against you, and he's heaven. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's putting on the show. He knows what he's doing. But his dad interrupts him. He's like, mm -mm. you guys go get everything ready for the party. Get his sandals, get his ring. Because the dad, he's like, yeah, you messed up. But you were my son the whole time. What do you mean no longer worthy to be my son? Like, since when does worthiness become a determining factor in being someone's child? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't know about your life. I lived a pretty good one. And when I came home with a report card that was good or bad, my mother did not wait to see if I had straight A's before she told me I was worthy enough to be her son, because that's not how it works. I was always worthy to be her son, straight A's or not, because she gave birth to me. The only thing that earns our right to sonship or daughterhood with God is being born. That's it. And think about it. We can't even do anything to be born. Our, our parents did something. You know what I'm saying? They, they did something to be born. It's not like the doctor is crouched down with a megaphone saying, come on, Alex. How weird. You can do it. Crawl your way out. Tina, you can just chill there for a second. He's, he's going to get out. He'll be fine. Come on. Like the whole family's gathered around with foam fingers and signs up. Alex can do it. Alex for MVP. Like you can do this thing. Cheering me on when it happened. That's not how it happened. My, my mother had to do a lot of stuff for nine months. She had to do a lot of stuff. And then on that day, she had to do a lot of stuff and go through some stuff. And my dad and most dads, they think they do a lot of stuff. They, I wouldn't say they do a lot of stuff, not compared to the mother, but they think they do. And the doctors, they do a lot of stuff in the process. But you want to know who doesn't do anything in the process? Us. We just... Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Turn real quick to 1 Peter chapter number one. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, not due to repentance, not due to anything that we've done. It says it's by his mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Repentance. See, this moment of being born again, it, it didn't have to do with us. While repentance does guide us toward 
being born again. We can't even be born again without what God has done. We can't even be born again without his mercy and without his power that raised Jesus from the dead. Repentance is vital in our walk with God. Don't let anyone tell you differently, but it does not earn us our place in the family, okay? Jesus earned us our place in the family. And now, while repentance doesn't determine our spot in the family, hear this. Repentance does determine our distance from dad, okay? Whenever I, was, um, whenever I graduated high school, I immediately, like within just a few months, moved four hours away to this little town called Hamilton, Alabama. And when I did, I didn't lose the Galleon name. I was still a son to my father. And um, I, me moving did not determine whether or not I was still in my family. But me moving and putting some distance between me and the family did determine whether or not I got to walk in the benefits of being in my family. When I moved, all of the sudden on Sundays, I didn't get the home-cooked meals because I was apart from the family. And when my car broke down, I couldn't just call up dad to come over and check it out because he was four hours away. And I didn't get the opportunity for my parents to show up at my house with a bunch of groceries and just say, oh, we just love you. We want to bless you with these all the time, like a lot of college students do. Why? Because there was distance between me and the family. Because of my decision, there was distance. And because there was distance, I didn't get the benefits of being in the family. Now, it's not because they didn't love me. It's not because they disowned me when I moved away. It's because there was a big gap that separated me from them. And in this story, we've got a son who wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to live by his own set of rules. He wanted to make his own life. He was done with what the father had been telling him to do. He was done being corrected by the father. And we know that he corrected his son because the Bible says all good parents correct their children. Even when you look at the, the story that we keep talking about that came right before this about the shepherd leaving the 99 to go find the one. Back in that culture, when a shepherd would leave the 99 sheep, and he would, not that they all had exactly 99 sheep, but if the shepherd were to leave his flock of sheep to go search for one that had wandered away, what he would do when he got to that sheep is he would take his staff and he would crack that sheep in the head with the staff. Now hear me. He doesn't hit the sheep in the head with the staff to punish the sheep for leaving. He did it to protect the sheep because he knows the next time that sheep thinks about leaving, he's going to think about getting cracked in the jaw by that staff. And as long as that sheep doesn't leave, then he gets to stay protected by the shepherd. But as soon as he leaves, he's out there on his own and he loses the protection. And the son, he didn't want his father's correction anymore. And so he left. And this point, it's mildly cheesy, but it gets the point across. Refusing the father's correction results in losing the father's protection in our lives. When we are choosing not to live lives of repentance, when we're choosing to just do our own thing, talk how we want, treat people how we want, do whatever we want to do, over choosing the father, this is what it looks like. It looks like God is handing us all this stuff because we're home with him right now. He's handing us all this stuff. He's handing us blessing and he's handing us purpose and he's handing us financial protection and he's handing us peace and he's handing us joy. He's handing us our spouse. He's, he's handing us all of this. He has it all right there. And when we choose to do our own thing and not live in repentance, what we're doing is we're slapping it out of his hand and we're saying, I see what you have to offer, but I don't want it. You can keep what you have to offer because I would rather do my own thing. And you know, the father, he's about true love. And so he's never going to force us to stay with him. And he's never going to force us to take what he has to give us. He's going to let us choose. And he will even let us choose to leave. He will let us choose sin over him. And when we do, hear me, God, he, he's not going to punish us. And the reason he's not 
It's because he already knows that the consequences of our sin will be punishment enough. All right, a lot of times we think that when we are just out of God's will, doing something that he doesn't want us to do, right, then he's just ready. He's, he's up there with his lightning bolt, ready to strike us down for being bad children. Remember, we talked about it last week, though. Jesus, he didn't come to punish humanity, right? He came to save humanity. If God wanted to punish us, he would never have sent Jesus. Jesus, he makes us righteous. God, he's not looking to punish us. He's just looking, he's looking to protect us, to protect us from the consequences of sin. God, he doesn't just hate sin because it's us breaking his rules. God wants us free from sin because he knows the cost of sin, right? Romans, it says the wages of sin are death. That's what sin cost us. And it's not just death to our physical body, death to our relationships, death to our finances, death to walking in purpose, death to peace, death to things working out for us, death to us being in the right place at the right time, death to our joy. Sin always equals death because sin always comes with consequences. And although that's not what the Father wants for us, he will let us choose it because... He's willing to let us learn the hard way. The hard way is not what he prefers, but he's willing to let us learn the hard way. As the band is making their way up, I want to share with you guys a story about my childhood. While my dad and my mother were still together, they had a, um, one of those floor heaters in your house. Right now, we've got the nice ones. You plug in. They just admit heat. No one can get burned by it. You can touch it all you want. You're not going to get burned. It's just going to heat up the house. Back then, that wasn't always the case. The heaters, they were metal. And if you touched them, you were going to burn your hand, okay? So they had one of these heaters. And they also had a, a young child by the name of Alex who has been a rebel at heart since the day he was born. And what would happen is I would crawl over to the heater and I would go to touch it. And then my mom would grab me and say, Alex, no. Don't touch that heater. And she'd put me back over here. Maybe a few days later, I'd crawl over. And I'd go to touch the heater. My dad, he'd pick me up. Alex, no, that, don't touch that heater. Put me back over here. Now, they weren't telling me not to touch the heater just because they're the parents and it's their way. They were telling me not to touch the heater because they knew the consequences that were going to happen when I touched the heater. And they did not want me to have to go through what was going to happen when I touched the heater. Now, give or take a little while. And my mom is gone. I have to put that in there because it's an important part of the story. It's just me and my dad. And my dad, he just decided that today Alex is going to learn the hard way. And so I crawl over to the heater. I say it was just us because... Mom would have never let me have that opportunity. I crawl over to the heater, and I look at him. He's just looking back at me. Put my hand up, edging towards the heater, looking at him. He's just like, just watching. He's not saying anything. He, know, he doesn't want me to touch it, but he's okay with me learning the hard way. He doesn't want me to go through the consequences. But if it's going to help me in the long run, he's going to let me. I'm looking at him. I touch the heater. And what happens? My hand gets burned, and I start crying. And I promise you my dad was irritated in that moment. And he's not irritated because I'm crying. He's not irritated because I just broke the rules. He's irritated because I had to suffer the consequences of disobedience. I had to go through what always happens when you sin, and it was death to my poor little finger. And you got to know, my dad, he still loved me after that happened. He, he wasn't done with me. His love isn't conditional, and the love of our Father is not conditional either. He still loves us when we make mistakes, and the love of the Father in this story, it wasn't conditional. And the Son, he learned that very quickly because culturally, the son, he should have lost his place of sonship. He did enough to lose that. He did enough to deserve um, him being cast out from the family. But the son learned really quickly that the entire time he was gone, 
making his bad mistakes, that the Father's love was still very much available to him. The Father was always willing to have him back. And thank goodness for the son's repentance. Thank goodness that he came home because that's what repentance is. It's when we come home. Repentance is when we choose to return home to the Father and choose Him over our sin. You guys can stand up as we're about to close. The offer is the same for everybody in the room this morning. Come home. Whether you have been living for God for one day, whether you've been living for God for 30 years, the best way you know how, maybe you've never lived for God a day in your life, we can all choose to come home. Yeah, remember this story, it's not about an individual that was lost and gone out there. It was about someone who was in the family. And I believe today God he is inspiring in this room a fresh brokenness over sin. And it doesn't apply to people. It doesn't just apply to people who have never said yes to Jesus. It applies to everybody in the room. First John 1 John 1.8, if you claim that you have no sin, you're a fool and you're not living in the truth. Maybe your sin, it doesn't look like the sun's. Maybe it doesn't look like the person sitting next to you. But if you would be willing and honest and and, and you just believe the scriptures in general, that means that on the inside of all of us, there is something that is considered sin. There is something that we have been doing that God is asking us today to choose Him over instead of choosing that sin. So today, I'm gonna count to three. And if you want to experience that forgiveness, and that cleansing that you experienced maybe the first time that you repented, it is available for you again today. Today, if you are ready to gain some victory over some sin that has been holding you back, then I give you the option to return home and to repent over some of the stuff that we've been dealing with. And I'm not gonna waste any more time. On the count of three, if that's you, I wish this altar was bigger because this applies to